And then on the lower right, it's really very extraordinary, and I'll show slides of this, uh, people who have made their, made their uh, money by selling the grain or whatever, uh, officials especially, are able to go to an inn over here in the lower right, uh, a wine shop and restaurant and so on. Uh, this structure here, which looks like some kind of construction, is really a advertising, uh, something advertising a wine shop. And I'll show details of that. Uh, one very like it appears in the Qingming Shang Ho too. Uh, so, okay. All right then, so much for that. I'll start now on, on details. <clears throat> My colleague Richard Bernhardt, by the way, is much more committed than I am to continuing the traditional emphasis on the great masters of the period, Dung Yuan and Zhu Ran and Jing Hao and the rest of them, referring to the phenomenon that I've been trying to define, this pursuit of spatially intricate compositions that are to be explored visually. He referred to it as, quote, empty spatial gimmicks. Well, we had an exchange on this subject, a symposium in 1970. Um, I respect his view, as always, but my view is different. My view is that for their time, these were anything but empty spatial gimmicks. They represented the culmination of centuries of the artist's growing sophistication in rendering space, interpenetrating spaces, intricate spatial systems. This was not to last, as I say, into the great age of landscape painting in the early Song. The purposes of the major masters of that period are really very different. But we can recognize this nevertheless, the paintings of this kind, as preserving in works actually of the period an important and fascinating, technically high-level development, which we should be aware of in looking at paintings described to the 10th century. Here is the upper left corner, where we see the, the official sent by the government, presumably, government official, seated at his desk, uh, wearing a robe, uh, official's cap, uh, looking large, and so on. And beside him, hunched over and as if a bit subservient or servile, a merchant maybe, or another official, whoever it is, uh, offering him something. And he's, uh, this official is keeping track of the whole operation and all the finances and all the rest of it. So he's in charge of all this. And he looks out over the scene as though he, uh, you know, commands everything he can see, which he does. Okay, and down in front of him here are various lower class people um, working out with the piles of grain, loading it and, and uh, so forth, carrying carrying uh, sacks of grain, etc. Next. Now here you see the main central part with the apparatus. And this, as I say, is of great interest to people who are interested in technology. And uh, this was at the beginnings, or toward the beginnings of a great age of the development of technological uh, what, uh, things in China, uh, and what we would call a proto-science. That's the whole subject, as I say, of Joseph Needham's great series of books, which he did with collaborators. I won't get into all that again, but okay. Uh, this, this kind of thing is very important. Down below, the water <coughs> fed into it from the canal lock uh, turns the wheel, another wheel turning another apparatus. I'm not sure what this does up above, but the main one anyway is, is connected by this tall uh, pole, whatever. Uh, to the water mill and up above. Up to the left of it you see two people working and various other servants. One of them here is wearing a loincloth behind. They're close up. This is the upper part. Uh, the two wheels, those two stone wheels, one grinding against the other, and the servants pouring the, pouring the grain into it through a kind of funnel and it uh, goes into the space between the two uh, wheels and is ground, and then you see the flower uh, on the below as it drip, as it falls from the from the grinding wheels, and you see a kind of scoop with which they would scoop it up and put it in sacks and take it away and so on. Okay. Also, the architecture, as in other paintings I've shown, is shown very in great detail here. Next, down below. Now, the lower right part, the lower right portion of the scroll. Uh, here in the uh, above, you see more servants um, uh, carrying sacks of grain and, and scooping it up and me measuring it and so on. And then people coming by boat and landing at these landings from which they can carry the grain sacks up above 
and then across the uh, across the stream or river or whatever it is uh, <clears throat> is this inn with this construction in front, which, as I say, is a uh, sort of advertising really. I mean, it's pro proclaiming this to be an inn to attract people. It's not a construction, in other words, and it's built presumably out of wood or bamboo uh, members. Quite intricate piece of drawing. You imagine trying to draw something like this with, uh, you know, th things seen through things. Uh, well, we'll see as we go along. The next, please. Now, in the upper story of this inn, uh, here at the sort of upper right, people are having a banquet in in one in this upper uh, uh, room, and you see them through the window, and then over here on the left is a figure seen through another open window, half seen. This figure is half seen in the doorway zone are, are popular in early Chinese art. I could, you could make a whole lecture out of those, a number of them. And they attract us with, our, with their color. So <clears throat> we look down inside, up, we look inside this building, so to speak, and are able to see what is going on inside. The artist also makes us feel as though we were looking down into spaces between the buildings. Again, the next please. Here is this, expo uh, as I say, uh, something that, uh, that uh, encourages exploration. And you actually see between the roofs uh, various uh, bits of architecture and whatever is down below. So it, it really encourages, as I say, it almost demands this kind of looking, looking, looking and finding more and more. And here you see, by the way, at the left, this uh, construction. Well, as I've said many times, you you have to imagine that all this done by in a system where you can't really uh, correct. You can, uh, there's a certain amount of overlapping here. I mean, the artist sometimes doesn't bother to uh, continue his lines or cross other lines, but mostly it's distinct. And <clears throat> in the very first lecture, second lecture rather, I showed already in the Han Dynasty the device of having nearer things drawn in heavier line and further things in lighter line. And here you see it, marvelously used to give space to this intricate structure. The further side drawn in notably lighter line. By the way, on the far side, there's a flag hanging there saying wine or new wine or something like that, advertising. So you actually look through this intricate structure, intricately drawn, uh, with all the, the parts of it tied together with a uh, little string or ropes or whatever, uh, and you see this flag advertising it. And then, okay, the next please. Uh, down below, as I mentioned, the um, uh, one could do a study of Chinese barrows, wheelbarrows, uh, barrows of various kinds for carrying things, just from this painting. Um, and there's an ox here who presumably pulls one of them. The one nearest to us here has on it a what seemed to be uh, pack backpack uh, frames, which uh, people can they can use then to carry the the, the, the heavy loads of grass of, of excuse me of grain uh, to the uh, to the mill. Okay, the next, the last slide for this <laughs> this extraordinary painting. Here is the opening the the entrance to the to the um, inn, and in addition to this tall uh, ornamental. Uh, structure outside, there is a screen which is always set up in front of doorways like this, keep evil spirits from coming in, whatever. So you have to walk around this screen to uh, to get in. And you look down between the screen and the uh, the wall of the uh, the entrance to the inn, and you see a servant half cut a wall, cut off here, wearing a cap. You see, uh, sort of looking around the thing as if sort of inviting you in. Well, most extraordinary of all, you look further and you find that you can look across the room to the further wall, and you see you see two scrolls of calligraphy hanging there on the further wall. My God, this is amazing! I mean, it really what the artist shows you and the, the invitations that the artist offers to you are quite amazing. And it seems you never quite exhaust the spaces uh, and the intricacies and the. Uh, details and the rewards of looking that this scroll offers. The uh, you do see, by the way, a much foreshortened sign saying 
new wine? Is there some kind of wine? Anyway, advertising wine on the frame. Okay, enough for that. Uh, enough for that quite amazing painting. Um, now, finally for this lecture, I want to show a painting that uh, is has virtually nothing to do with these before. But I, I want to show it anyway because I take it to be a fine and neglected genuine work of the 10th century, probably, or maybe 11th century, anyway, from the Liao dynasty. And uh, as I said, the Liao, uh, Liao were a non-Han Chinese people, Kitan. Kitan, uh, Kitai was the, their, their realm. And Kitai is what gave rise eventually to the name Cathay, which is an old word for China, still used for restaurant names and so on, Cathay, Kitai. And the Kitans uh, named their dynasty, which they founded when they came down and took over much of the northern and northeast areas of the, of the area we think of as China, um, as, um, as the Liao dynasty. Okay, anyway, the Liao uh, or Kitan dynasty lasted uh, until the beginning of the 12th century when they were uh, replaced by another nomadic people, and I'll talk about that. Anyway, this is a fine and I think genuine hand scroll by the most famous of the Liao artists, an artist named Hu Huai, or Hu Gui, it's differently pronounced, Kitanese painter, not Han Chinese that is, 